So today I'm going to talk to you about can I do an epidural in a patient with Can I advance the slides in a patient with? <laughs> Bleeding problems, back problems, pre-existing infection. These days, it seems that every patient that we see has something wrong with them. And the things we worry about, the complications, hematoma, nerve injury, abscess meningitis, and sometimes we worry that these epidurals won't even work. Now, you have to forgive me. This is Moses parting the snow instead of the waters. I'm from Boston. All we can think about is snow. So when I was thinking about this talk, I thought I need an analogy. And of course, the only analogy that came to me was one of snow. And the way it came to me was I thought, prior to this winter, I thought snow was just snow. And now I realize that snow is on a continuum. It can be good, it can be okay, it can be bad, and it can be very bad. So as we go through this, these various scenarios where patients come to us with things in their back or things about them that we worry about with their epidurals, I'd like to also think of them on a continuum from low risk to high risk, good, bad, or very bad. When we think about bleeding problems, the major complication we think about is hematoma. And let's talk about a few things within that thrombocytopenia, factor deficiencies, anticoagulation. So first, epidural hematoma. Pictured on the right, that's a very large epidural hematoma. The problem with it is that all of that white is a blood collection that's pressing on the nerves and robbing it essentially of its blood supply and oxygen. Now I've been asked at other conferences, isn't this what we do with a blood patch? What's different about this? And the reality is, when we first put in a blood patch, it's a lot like this. The patient complains of some back pain. She may even complain of some radiculopathy. And usually, that's when, if we haven't already stopped infusing, we do stop. But the difference is that it's self-limited in a blood patch. In a blood patch, we know from very good MRI studies in the late 1990s, the blood diffuses out within a few hours, and it's in the subcutaneous tissue. But with an epidural hematoma, the blood keeps collecting and collecting and putting that pressure. On the other side of the slide is the good news. Our obstetric patients are really, really very hardy, and they do a lot better than our surgical patients when it comes to these kind of complications. So no matter what group you look at and what study, and you'll hear more about the last, which is the SCORE project from Dr. D'Angelo. The incidence of epidural hematomas in our patients, no matter which of our patients we're putting these techniques in, is extremely low, one in 250,000. So let's look at thrombocytopenia, because that's probably the most common. About 80% of the patients have gestational thrombocytopenia. Another 20% related to preeclampsia or help and 1 to 5 percent idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, or ITP. Let's remind ourselves what those are, and then whether we have to worry about it. Gestational thrombocytopenia usually shows up in the third trimester, and the numbers are usually pretty good. And I have 70 to 80 percent there, because in a moment we'll talk a little bit about that range. The numbers are usually above this. The platelet function is usually very good. The reason for this thrombocytopenia, hemodilution, sequestration, a little platelet destruction. And although there's therapy listed down below, these patients almost never need therapy. And they're really in a good position for us to put our epidurals and spinals into. ITP. This is a pre-existing disease, although it's possible that the first time it could be noted is when a pregnant patient comes because she may not have intersected with the healthcare system very much. But this should be present in the first trimester of pregnancy. This is when the numbers can get low, less than 70 to 80,000. The platelet function is not only normal, it's quite good. These are like super platelets. And these are the cases that you see in the literature where patients got an epidural, and oh my God, when you looked at the platelet count, it was in the single digits. There actually is a case report. 
or two of that. And guess what? The patient did okay. Now, I'm not suggesting that we put in epidurals when patients have 9,000 platelets. But what I am saying is that, in general, A, these patients do well. B, what you will find is that sometimes these patients will receive therapy before they come to the labor floor, a dose of steroids, very rarely IV gamma globulin, but they're usually receiving therapy to satisfy us so that we like the number that we see because the reality is they do well with their clotting for their delivery, for their C-section, for their neuraxial anesthesia at reasonably low numbers. The preeclampsia help patients are in some ways the most challenging. Their platelet count can be variable. There is some degree in which their clotting is abnormal. There's increased platelet activation, but also some decrease in clotting. And needless to say, the thing that's really going to fix them is delivery, although some have tried to use steroids in order to bump the numbers. There is a lot of work on point of care testing to try to get at what is the right level for us to place our neuraxial anesthetics where the clotting abnormalities are not too bad, and there's some work that's focused on 75,000 and some newer work that said, well, actually, you can see clotting abnormalities above that. And I'll tell you in a moment what many of us have sort of settled upon, but there's no randomized controlled studies. You will, however, hear from Dr. Butwick a lot more about this point of care testing later on. So the bottom line, unfortunately, no lowest acceptable platelet count for neuraxial anesthesia. Most of the numbers that you hear thrown out are actually for ITP, and that's where the hematological community has come in and said, greater than 80,000, 75,000, and these are two publications from blood where international consortiums of hematologists have come together and said, there are your numbers. Now, more and more what I see is people sort of congregating around those numbers, and patients are doing well. Uh, again, for preeclampsia, these are not the patients they're talking about, although more and more what I see is people congregating around those numbers for preeclampsia as well. We'll see if Dr. Butwick has anything to tell us about where we should be congregating. I can say that in our unit, what we do is, is follow these sort of basic rules, and you'll have to tell me about what you guys do. In general, we prefer lower platelet numbers when the function is good, sort of reasonable. Platelet placement and removal of the catheter, if you're talking about epidurals, are both leading challenges in the eyes of the hematologists and us. So whatever criteria you're using for the placement, you might think of using for the removal. Certainly, the clinical scenario is everything, and that's where you get to the, the preeclamptic patients. So straight labor analgesia is one thing, but when you're talking about a severe preeclamptic woman or even a HELP syndrome woman with an unfavorable airway, a high risk of cesarean delivery, you can certainly easily come to the point where her incredibly unlikely risk of an epidural hematoma is not something that's going to outweigh all of the benefits. And with the HELP syndrome patients, we'll often place the epidurals when their platelet count is in the range we were just talking about a moment ago, and then wait to pull it, knowing that her platelet count is going to plummet until it recovers. So we can have some conversation about that later. And then finally, some people will go lower with their platelet counts for a single-shot spinal than they will for an epidural. And this is something that the hematologic community comments on as well. So there is even a statement in one of these articles that 50,000 may be acceptable for some anesthesiologists for a single shot spinal. Factor deficiencies, a word on that. The most frequent hereditary disorder in terms of factor deficiency is von Willebrand's disease. And most of these patients are type 1, and it's good news. They correct during pregnancy. They usually correct in the third trimester. I'm not going to go through the detail, but below is a von Willebrand panel screen, four lab tests, the last of which is normal coags, the, the usual coags you're used to seeing. Something to think about. These lab tests don't come back quickly, so not something to send when the patient comes to the labor floor and you're waiting to put in an epidural. Something that they should have sent prior. If they have adequate amounts of von Willebrand's factor in their third trimester, 
They will when they come to deliver. You don't have to recheck the numbers. And they don't have to have 100%. They just have to have, in some cases, 50% or more within the normal range. And these patients do very well with their neuraxial anesthetics during delivery. They do, however, drop their, their amounts of coagulation factors pretty quickly after delivery. So these are the patients where you may want to get the, the catheters out, and they do have an incidence of postpartum hemorrhage. By the way, they can be DDAVP responsive, so if you do get into trouble during the delivery, something to think about. And I just put this here to remind you that there are patients with all kinds of different factor deficiencies that you may see, some of them real zebras. If you do encounter one of these, you should know that many, many of them do correct to larger or greater extent during pregnancy, but not all of them. So each one should be looked up independently if you encounter such a patient. Now, the world has gotten very complicated in terms of anticoagulation, but we who deal with obstetric women are very lucky in this respect. Thus far, no one really wants to try all those fancy things on pregnant women. So the vast majority of pregnant women that we see are still on pretty straightforward things. They're on low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin for their various thrombophilias and other reasons. What is typically done is patients are started on low molecular weight heparin till about 36 weeks. Just to sort of talk about that for a moment, the basic ASRA guidelines are you should delay placement of a neural axial anesthetic for 12 hours after prophylactic dose, 24 hours after therapeutic dose, and the new FDA advisory has basically changed from two to four hours to wait before restarting the low molecular weight heparin. That's the biggest change. Usually, at 36 weeks, the low molecular weight heparin is changed to unfractionated heparin, and that's really for our benefit as much as anything else. And that's so if they happen to come in unexpected and they haven't started their sub-Q heparin dose, we can measure their PTT. Couple things about that. One, sub-Q does not mean low dose. So you can have a patient come in on sub-Q unfractionated heparin, and she can be very anticoagulated. So look at the amount. If she's on less than 10,000 units in 24 hours, which is the typical 5,000 units BID, you don't need to check the PTT. If she's taken her dose, then remember the peak effect is at two hours. So usually the neuraxial procedure is recommended any time after four hours. If, however, she's taken more than 5,000 units BID, it's recommended to check the PTT. So let's start talking about some of those back problems. You saw some of those scary pictures from Dr. Palmer. We worry about complications. We worry about non-functional epidurals, disc disease, scoliosis, spina bifida, and all those other horrible things. Let's start looking into them. Well, for as long as anyone can remember, people have worried about doing spinals and epidurals in patients with pre-existing disease. This was a New England Journal article in the 1950s where our colleagues said, don't go there, basically. What were they afraid of? So this is actually the, what's called the double crush hypothesis, which you've certainly heard about or talked about a lot. And that's basically if you have an axon that has a mild injury, and then you come at it with another even small insult, your spinal or your epidural or your local anesthetic, you're going to basically wipe it out as though it had had a major denervation injury. And that's going to be big trouble. So is that what's happening to our patients? Well, there's not a lot of specific data in the literature about our patients and this. So I'm going to show you whatever I do know. Again, from Dr. D'Angelo, the SCORE project. What are our major complications in obstetric anesthesia? There are other things listed here. Failed intubation, high block, respiratory arrest, unrecognized spinal catheter but we don't see our neurologic injuries on here. These are in non-pregnant patients, older patients, almost a thousand looked at retrospectively. They had all kinds of things going on, radiculopathy, neuropathy, 
spinal stenosis, and 20% of them had had back surgery, laminectomies, where you can literally think of taking off the ligamentum flavum as you do the procedure. And guess what? They did incredibly well. The ones who did the, had the surgery, 97% efficacy of their neuraxial anesthetics, no difference in neurologic complications. And the ones who had exacerbations of their underlying neurologic diseases, they were the ones who had many of these things at the same time. Was it their surgery? Was it their anesthesia? Was it their underlying disease? And remember, these are older, sicker patients. Really hard to tell, and hard to tell if they're a good analogy to our patients. These are patients who are even worse off. These are 140 patients who not only 20% of them had all that back stuff going on, but they had scary neurologic diseases, post-polio, multiple sclerosis, traumatic spinal cord injury. And people were brave enough to do spinals and epidurals and combine spinal epidurals and CSEs on them. And they got paresthesias as they were putting them in. They got bloody taps, just like we do. And guess what? The blocks were good. No new or worsening post-op neurologic deficits. So a decade or two or three or four later, the conclusion Neuraxial anesthesia, you really can't say it's contraindicated in these patients, at least not from any data we have. I feel like I have to mention MS, multiple sclerosis, because it's sort of much maligned in pregnancy. Um, we, we sort of grew up with the notion that these patients really should not get neuraxial anesthesia. And I often hear people respond and, and say this. And this is a the neurologic disease in pregnancy is a particular area of mine, so I feel a little protective of this. If you talk to neurologists, any neurologists, those who, who really specialize in this area, they will tell you that all the data shows that pregnancy does not affect disability progression of disease, nor does delivery mode, obstetrical complications, epidural analgesia, breastfeeding, or anything else that they can really think about. The confusing or perhaps thing that confounds the picture is that in the year of pregnancy, women have the same relapse rate as they do any other year. However, the pregnant months are relatively protective which means that she's going to have all her relapse in those few months of the postpartum, whether you do your anesthetic or not. This is actually a review of all of the cases in the literature and whether these patients got neurologic complications when they got their anesthetics. I don't expect you to be able to read it, and I'm not trying to trick you by making it really small. But if you look at the last column, none reported, none reported, not till the bottom do you even see someone with a little bit of a, an exacerbation of a sensory deficit. The second study that's circled, the reason why I circled it is because it's the one that's cited over and over again. It was a few patients who had a little bit of an exacerbation of their MS had epidurals with slightly higher concentrations of local anesthetic. And the conclusion, it was a speculated conclusion by the authors, the investigators, that said maybe the problem was their epidural. And from that, it's been repeated over and over and over again, this myth that pregnant patients shouldn't have epidurals or spinals if they have MS. So let's go on to a few other things, disc disease. Although the spread of contrast, if you look through with fluoroscopy, is pretty weird and funky, the patients do extremely well. I just give you one study where patients who had discectomies, lumbar discectomies, no difference in bupivacaine consumption, no difference in time to epidural catheter placement, or no difference in catheter replacement. What you do worry about, though, is that if the women spend their whole time compressing these already inflamed nerves, or they get into kooky positions, which they never would have done if they didn't have an epidural in place, they could be in trouble. So what I do when I consult or consent or consult on these patients is I say, someone in the room has to be in charge of whatever those positions are that you can't be in. Someone has to take note that you're not going to feel yourself go into those positions when you have your epidural in. 
And clearly that's not going to be us, the, the anesthesia team. So I sort of make them mindful of the fact that having the epidural will put them at risk by virtue of the numbness, not the epidural procedure itself. And certainly if these patients have postpartum deficits, they should be evaluated. Scoliosis, I'm just going to say a couple of things. Corrected and non-corrected, they actually can both potentially get spinals and epidurals. The landmarks will be funny in each. We happen to do a kind of exhausted review of all of the published cases, case reports and case series in the literature of patients who had both corrected and uncorrected scoliosis. We weren't surprised to find that especially for some of the corrected patients like Harrington Rods and such, that there were some patchy and non-functional blocks, of course. But what we were surprised was how many of the blocks really worked and how few wet taps or in, in, inadvertent dural punctures were reported, virtually none. Now that doesn't give you incidence data. That doesn't mean that, that these things aren't happening. It just means that people do have success. And we've had some success. If you have the right patient, if you have a motivated patient who understands the risks and understands that they might not be a good candidate for a blood patch, then these are patients that you can try. By the way, if they're uncorrected scoliosis, consider using ultrasound, considering going into the convexity of the curve or paramedian, and sometimes, believe it or not, having them be lateral is actually easier than having them sit up. Spina bifida occulta, a small bony defect, 20% of the population, everyone in the room has placed spinals and epidurals on these patients. It's usually an incidental finding. But spina bifida cystica, this is a problem. You would never think of trying a neuraxial anesthetic on someone who looked like that baby. But what if you saw a small dimple or a little tuft of hair? And what's very sort of confusing is that when women have this, they often shave off the tuft of hair. So all you see is the little dimple. You need to worry about this. And it's not the dimple per se, it's what's underlying the dimple. And to keep it simple, what I'll say is we really depend on the spinal cord ending and the cauda equina being free. Often what's under the dimple is a tethered cord that's actually long and attached and a perfect target for your spinal or epidural needle. Fortunately, in addition to the dimple, these patients will often have current sacral neurologic problems or a past history of sacral neurologic problems, bowel bladder problems. So ask and look. And I include this slide because basically they can have very scary things, syrinx, cysts, tumors in the lamina, but if they're not where you need to go, you often don't need to worry about it. I'm going to end with a quick word on bacterial and viral infections, because there's really not a lot to say. When you look for bacterial meningitis, 179 cases, very few OB, and mostly very obvious things, no masks, no gown, no gloves, occasionally with very difficult procedures. Epidural abscesses, exceedingly rare back pain, fever, if you suspect one, MRI is the, is the test of choice to do and they must be treated. But if you look at the studies, 474 non-obstetric patients with grossly infected hardware that needed to come out and neuraxial procedures f to get them out, no neuraxial infections as a result. Obstetric patients with choreo, some of them bacteremia, no neuraxial infections as a result. Animal data tells us that we should give preoperative antibiotics if we expect our hosts are bacteremic, and the ASA practice advisory says the same. Now, I'm not suggesting that we do spinals and epidurals in frankly septic, unstable patients, but we're talking about patients who come in with a fever or if someone has choreo and labor and needs an epidural or a spinal, but otherwise is well. The data is definitely on our side. And when you're thinking about viral infection in closing, there are no randomized controlled studies, but 
the one viral infection, and you're incredibly unlikely to see this, that you're particularly worried about tracking into the spinal or epidural space is primary herpes. And that's because it's expected to have a high viral load in the blood. Almost everyone you will see will have not their first herpes outbreak, but their second, third, fourth, or fifth, and you're fine to do neuraxial. Oral herpes, the worst thing that could happen is recrudescence of a cold sore. Zoster, people use epidurals to, pre to prevent post-herpetic neuralgia. Chickenpox, if an adult is sick with chickenpox, they can have a terrible pneumonia, probably better to have neuraxial. And HIV is all over the neuraxis already. So unless they have a super infection where you're really worried about spreading that, they can get neuraxial anesthesia, assuming they don't have other contraindications and even an epidural blood patch. So in summary, obstetric patients are incredibly hardy. They typically do well with neuraxial anesthesia. If you want to know what to do, much of it is just common sense, which all of you have a lot of already. And if you want to know where you are, consider using ultrasound. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you.